<laughs> Morning. Thank you for giving us uh, extra time. I really appreciate uh, Joff and the, uh, the others for the flexibility. Uh, all right. So in this session, my colleague Jayati and I will be presenting our uh, investigation of immersion cooling for data center hardware. We'll introduce the opportunities we see, the progress we made, and also the challenges we see that needs to be um, resolved before the uh, really actual implementation of scale. Uh, the first question for us, why immersion cooling? I know this the question has been answered for many users out there already, but just to reiterate that from our perspective, uh, the first important uh, benefit we are trying to achieve with immersion cooling is the density. It allows us to bring the components and systems closer, uh, which is a trend for future hardware and facility advantages. And second is performance, uh, supports the cheap power beyond air cooling limits. Uh, not to repeat that again, uh, everybody knows that this trend is coming. And also other benefits across efficiency, sustainability, reliab uh, reliability, etc., uh, which really matters a lot for hyperscaler um, users. Uh, if you do use a simple example, uh, for us, uh, air cooling is more like riding a bicycle, and the adoption of immersion cooling is more like riding a shuttle. Yes, with a bicycle, you can get maybe the entire team to the McDonald's across the street conveniently without a need of extra infrastructure. But if I want to get everyone in the room to invite to our cafe at the Menlo Park, I'll probably take a shuttle instead. Uh, immersion as a leading cooling technology uh, featuring for two things, uh, higher performance, enabling overclocking, higher power of the uh, products of components, allowing us to use a fuel racks to accommodate, uh, to accommodate the same uh, uh, total capacity of compute, storage, and uh, others. While also uh, the PUE reduction by adopting uh, immersion solutions is very significant. Uh, there are a lot of publications from our uh, peers uh, and partners in the OCP community before, and uh, we're just uh, you can refer to those publications for the data even. Uh, if you look at the, the theoretical pool of capability uh, projection between the different cooling technologies, uh, we have a very simple chart here shows comparison across the uh, single phase immersion, uh, natural convection, to the uh, air cooling, um, to the uh, single phase immersion force flow, and the potential immersion uh, single phase direct cheap liquid cooling and two-phase immersion with a boilerplate. Uh, we can see that the single-phase immersion can easily outperform traditional air cooling solutions at a given density requirement, and also the potential it is still yet to be uh, defined. There are a lot of active explorations in the area, and actually Summer has published there um, some uh, new ideas which uh, advance the performance of single-phase immersion uh, recently. Uh, two-phase immersion, it turned out to be uh, almost equivalent or could potentially perform better uh, than single phase cold plate at the given conditions. Of course, if you examine at the larger scales, there are a lot more factors to consider. Our colleague Joe uh, will co-present with the Vivian team all about our two-phase immersion studies in the afternoon. If you look at the efficiency side, uh, uh, clearly that liquid cooling can outperform air cooling at the given boundary conditions and requirements. We're hoping that immersion cooling has reached the same level of uh, efficiency at hardware level and data center level, and we see a good chance with outperforming even because it's um, have the uh, much higher percentage of coverage uh, of the power total power load compared to liquid cooling solutions. Of course, uh, the implementation of immersion cooling doesn't happen overnight. Uh, the transition needs to happen. And as of today, most of our data centers uh, have the traditional air cooling uh, enabled. Uh, and we are showing a very simple diagram here, going through the dry cooler, chiller train, and then to the liquid to air exchanger. So for example, the fine arrays, which uh, provide air supply to the hardware. And uh, it's a very clear goal for us to enable uh, liquid cooling for the f uh, future AI hardware. Uh, across our fleet and uh, bring in uh, extra layer, extra loop, which is the uh, water technical coolant uh, solution loop, uh, and uh, bring the P25 based coolant to co plates. So that's a day one L plus liquid cooling facility, or we can call it a hybrid facility. Now moving on to day two. Uh, if you, want, if you want to in introduce immersion cooling when it's ready, when it makes sense, uh, we'll have a third loop added in, which uh, bring uh, the water to dielectric exchanger, provides light electric supply to the immersion cooled hardware without uh, completely rebuild or redesign of the existing facility. 
So in an ideal world, if the conditions allows and uh, if the use case exists, uh, there could be one day where we have the data center uh, in certain locations for certain use case, full with 100% immersion cooled hardware. And that allows us to remove the fan array, uh, allows us to remove the water to PG25 uh, CDU, only keeping the immersion uh, secondary loop. And uh, if the performance is there, we can also remove the chiller trim, allowing 40C plus secondary loop supply temperature, which brings great value in uh, efficiency and also enable opportunity for heat reuse. Of course, uh, it's not free. Uh, there are a variety of challenges we need to address. Even at the first front uh, engineering level, there's material compatibility, there's signal integrity, there is uh, fluid selection availability, which a lot of um, partners in the community are already working on them, a lot of streams. Uh, then moving on, there will be a transition period time where we would have both air cooling uh, and immersion cooled hardware coexisting uh, in the same data center, uh, in the same generation. And uh, that requires hardware design transition, facility design transition, and also backward forward compatibility. And finally, uh, large scale deployment, uh, there's environmental and safety impact to be addressed, ecosystem readiness as you evaluated, uh, also the liability process recycling disposal of the materials, um, those protocols need to be set up across a variety of partners uh, in the ecosystem. And uh, of course, we don't address this challenge step by step. Uh, I mean, we just don't finish one and wait until that to, fin to address the second one. Uh, the company is working on all those together. We just foresee that some need to be addressed much upfront, some can be uh, fully completed late in a later time. So what's our vision? Um, Short-term vision, I want to focus on the, uh, enabling the single-phase immersion with PFAS-free fluids. Uh, while we are open to explore all immersion cooling environments, uh, but everyone knows there are conditions, there are restrictions. Uh, and we are focusing on enablement of high-density computer products with immersion um, at the engineering level. Uh, the end goals of our efforts would be to enable the capability that supports uh, all the component power roadmaps, scalability uh, to allow us to deploy the products across uh, various regions on a larger scale, uh, reliability target, compatibility target, and uh, of course, last but not least, sustainability goals. Next, I'll pass to my colleague, Jetty. Thank you, Cheng. So as Cheng talked about um, our short-term vision as well as the goals that we have, uh, and to that end, we have multiple immersion explorations that we are undertaking. Um, so here I'll be talking about the single phase ones, and as uh, Cheng mentioned, we have another talk later by a colleague uh, who will go more into the details about the two phase ones. So for the single phase, uh, what were the goals, right? Um, so we wanted to investigate immersion as a technology and then also benchmark uh, it against air cooling, which we have been using for so long. Secondly, we wanted to develop an understanding uh, and expertise in various aspects for immersion cooling, uh, including uh, sustainability, signal integrity, compatibility, and so on. Also, we wanted to uh, get our feet wet uh, no pun intended, and also have a first-hand experience about the roadblocks and modifications that would be needed for immersion adoption. So for a lot of these studies, um, we have used the Yosemite YV 3.5 server, which was contributed a few months ago. So the configuration of the server, uh, as you can see, we have four servers to a sled, and then we have three sleds in a chassis. Um, and I'll be talking about this a bit more in the next slide. Um, so as I mentioned, there were um, explorations at multiple levels and scales. Uh, so from the left, you can see uh, we had single server TTV-based setups. Uh, and this was uh, primarily used to optimize the thermal solution at the module level um, and to see how can we best uh, improve the thermal characteristics there. Uh, from there, we scaled it up to actual silicon-based uh, sled level test setup, um, moving uh, further ahead to like a multi-chassis level setup, um, also a partial tank testing. And then recently, we, ha we have been working on some tank developments, uh, which is then customized for our use cases and for our data centers. 
So from all these studies, uh, we observe multiple trends, and we wanted to show uh, just a few here. So the firstly, uh, first one is about thermal performance, right? Uh, particularly the cooling capability. So as you can see in the chart here, uh, we are showing cooling capability ratio on the y-axis, and then on the x-axis, we are trying to benchmark the air cooling with single phase immersion. So as you can see, uh, on the module level, uh, you see a significant increase uh, in the thermal cooling capability, as well as uh, for the memory, or in particular here, for the dim cooling as well. Uh, and this is especially important because we, um, we see the trends that in compute, we expect not just the module powers to keep growing, but then also the memory capacity and bandwidth requirements to continue to grow tremendously as well. Uh, secondly, with immersion, uh, we could potentially eliminate heat sinks for a lot of auxiliary components, uh, like the read timer switches, uh, CXL A6, boot drives, etc. cetera. Uh, so both of these, uh, as I mentioned before, were based on our 1U server, uh, which is a Yosemite YB3.5 server. The next trend uh, is about rack density. So this is one of those areas where immersion can really uh, be very useful can, and actually show a lot of benefits. So here again, on the y-axis, we are showing rack power uh, that is supported, or we can also interpret that as a power per unit area uh, that can be supported in the DC. And then the x-axis is, again, the air cooling versus immersion cooling. So here, again, you can see a significant increase uh, in the power densities that can be supported uh, for a given uh, area. The next thing that we would like to talk about is material compatibility. So uh, I know we heard many talks about material compatibility, uh, and it's very well understood today how crucial this is for single phase immersion uh, and, and its adoption at scale, right? Um, so just as an example here, one of our early setups, we did run into some of these issues, uh, as you can see in the image. Uh, within a week, we actually saw some discoloration uh, in one of the test setups. Um, and you know the root cause analysis indicated that uh, there was EPDM material in the tubes and hoses, uh, which was interacting with the hydrocarbon fluids. Um, we actually did continue testing with this even after discoloration just to see the impact on thermal performance and reliability. Uh, immediately, there was no um, apparent impact, but the long-term impact needs to be studied, and these needs to be continued, um, continued studying for this. Um, so again, uh, this led us to a look into like alternate compatible materials for the test setups, and we did go through doing uh, creating a matrix for like material compatibility with a typical hydrocarbon as well as with a typical fluorochemical um, so we did use the work contributed by the material compatibility work stream here and the white paper that we had published for the test methodology where you know we do soaking tests at high temperatures for more than two weeks um, to observe the impact uh, between a material that is chosen and the fluid also, as it is known, um, the fluorochemicals I have relatively less concern when it comes to material compatibility uh, as opposed to the hydrocarbons, as can be seen here. So this brings us to some of the limitations, followed by the call for action. So the first one is about the flow distribution and management, right? So what we observed here is that effectively scaling immersion solutions from like a single server level all the way up to like a tank level um, is somewhat difficult because the performance that we observe at a server level may not always translate to a tank level because of various reasons, including bypass. Um, and I think this also then relates to controlling the heat transfer regime that we are targeting, because if you're targeting forced convection, we may not always remain in that regime, and we might transition to natural convection because of bypass reasons. The second one is board design and layout. Uh, as I mentioned, one of the major benefits that we can get from immersion cooling is densifying the systems and supporting high power densities. Um, of course, this can be done uh, by making changes at the system level. Uh, but like one of the inputs that we really need for this um, is uh, essentially working from the board layout itself and not just retrofitting air cooling servers uh, to immersion cooling, but actually designing systems that are meant for immersion cooling to really unlock those density benefits. The other is the warranty considerations. We definitely need all the component manufacturers to uh, you know, work more towards uh, providing warranties to be used with immersion cooling. 
Um, the next one is about thermal interface materials. So there has been some uh, progress towards this, and today we do have uh, materials which are compatible with immersion. Um, however, they do come with some constraints of loading force as well as requiring thermal cycling for them to be effective. Um, secondly, their effectiveness is not uh, nearly as high um, as the uh, alternatives that we have for air cooling. So if you really want to reduce the TIM2 component uh, of resistance in the stack, I think we still need more work to be done in regards to TIMs. And the last one is material compatibility, uh, fluid recycling, and sustainability. So material compatibility we already talked about, uh, and I know there is more work uh, happening there already. But we do need uh, standardized processes uh, for fluid recycling as well as sustainability metrics so that we can choose the fluids accordingly. This brings us to the call to action. So as a community, um, you know, we need to work on more mature solutions, um, which again, the first point being just how can we effectively scale these solutions? And then also uh, have solutions which offer optionalities for different use cases, because use cases might differ by power densities, um, the size of the fleet, and so on. The second one is about certified parts and materials, and this also relates to the warranties that I was talking about earlier, as well as we need like certifications and compatibility list between materials, um, as well as fluids, different components and fluids. And the last one is fluid choice. Um, so how to select the ideal fluid, right? Um, so I think that is the uh, key area that we need more work in, because all applications might require different fluid selection based on their uh, critical criteria. Um, so that is one where we are looking to, uh, hoping for more work uh, to be done as well. And we, as I mentioned, we need standards to translate uh, to our sustainability goals and metrics, uh, including those for the fluids. And with that, that's the end of our presentation. If there are any questions, we can take them now. <laughs>